I am Emma. And I am Carrie. And today our special guest is Mr. Patrick Swayze. Yay! So Patrick is one of my favorite actors. Although I haven't seen, I have to say, I haven't seen all his movies, but he was uh, an actor that I fell in love with as a very young girl, and uh, that's why I'm blushing like this. Um, he is beautiful, gorgeous, beautiful dancer. Um, he was very strong. He was very smart, and he was an incredible actor. And he was just an overall good person is the vibe that I was getting when I was communicating with him. Now, I know that uh, Patrick was from Houston, and it's where you are, Carrie. So yeah. did you ever see him in Houston? No, no, no. I think we, we, we thought we maybe had, we knew where his ranch was in Tomball. I don't know if we made that up looking back, you know, that we really wanted him to be near our high school. But, um, but I don't know that he really came back all that often. I mean, I know he still has, he's from not too far from where we are and people have stories and, and um, so yeah, no. He said he was a lot in California, but he did come home every now and then. Yes, he came from a big family, but he was amazing. I mean, just beyond doing what we all know that he did. I mean, he had this affinity for animals and horses and he was a pilot and he, I mean, he was sort of the all around dude badass that could really dance. How cool is that? I know. And, and as a dancer myself, I had, I did, I did ballet for about 10 years and then I did street dance and I did some um, competition with a friend of mine and it was a lot of fun. You know, I always looked up to dancers and Patrick Swayze was one of them. Gene Kelly was my other all time favorite. And, you know, um, so I always had this fascination for the way that he danced and he did it so effortlessly and, and with grace. And um, it was just beautiful to watch. It was beautiful to watch. Yeah, it, it really was. It kind of really kind of spoke with us women too because it was I keep going back to that word he was it was like that hard badass you know tough guy that had the sweet gooey side too and could dance and we fell in love and I mean as as I know it he fell in love with his wife when they were she was really young I mean he they were both really young but they were together the whole time that's unheard of these days especially in Hollywood he's saying like, yeah 14 was when they first met isn't that incredible? And his mother was a dance instructor. And so that's, I believe, where they met. He says, yes, they met in a dance school. But he says, you know, I wasn't the best kind of boyfriend because when we first met, we, all, we felt attracted to each other. And I was kind of a ladies' man. I was <laughs> seducing a lot of uh, young women. Um, and um, sometimes we would make out, but it wasn't really a relationship. And it was flirting a little bit here and flirting a little bit there. And then I would go off and I would do ice skating. And I would be flirting with women over there. So, you know, I wasn't, you know, uh, right away the stay with one girl kind of type. He says, so, you know, I would, I would, and then I would come back after having flings here and there, and then we would, you know, take off where we left it, and whenever mom, you know, I remember he says that she came over, and um, he's not giving me the reason why, but he's showing me that she kind of stayed with them, like she, she um, <clears throat> moved in for a little bit. Um, with the family, and um, <laughs> you kind of remind me of me and Gerald. Um, <laughs> you, you, you froze. Oh, okay. And basically, it was just showing me that um, that she moved in for a little bit. Something with problems with the family, or I'm not sure what. But um, and and so whenever his mom or something stepped out, they would start making out behind the couch or sneak around everywhere and, and do things that you know make sure nobody saw it. So I was saying that reminds me of me and Gerald when we went to go see his parents. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be you sneak a kid. Whoops. Um, but um. Eventually, it became, you know, he became very dedicated to her, he says, and um, 
she was the only woman for him, um, especially after they got married. <laughs> um, so it's a good time to get he never monogamy. Um, you know, he says people talk, but he's saying that I always stayed truthful and faithful to her. Um, and she did to me as well. Oh, I, she, is, she was just beautiful or is just beautiful. Do you, do you get to see her? Do you ever, do you ever go see her? That's actually one of our questions. He's saying, of course. And I'm, I send her music because I loved music and I loved writing music. Um, and so I send her songs on her way in the car, um, sometimes in stores where she walks in, uh, just to remind her of me. And I'm happy to see that she took my advice and she's moving on with her life. Um, after, you know, a lot of people are, are judging her for that, that she's moving on and she's engaged and, 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 and getting married. And, um, but I told her to move on. I told her that she should not um, contain herself, that she should not restrict herself in finding new love, and that she should just go with the flow and follow her heart, and I will be with her every step of the way, supporting her and loving her. Um, so I'm happy to see that she took my advice and that she's found happiness again after a long time of pain and grief and separation. So. Mm. I get to visit my family all the time. Well, okay, since you mentioned this, yesterday I was in the car and I heard for the first time in 10 years a song from Dirty Dancing, The Time of Your Life. Was that you? <laughs> yeah. I this. <laughs> That's so cool. Thank you. I, I figured it might have been. Oh, wow. Okay, so... As a lot of us know, you passed away from cancer, and and at one point we really thought you beat it, and um, and I was very sad when you didn't because you were so young. Um, was that really your time to go in the way, and why did you choose that way to go? Was it really my time to go that way? No, um, it was something that was created. It was an expression of. Um, the energies that I had created in my journey. Um, but it was an exit that was peaceful. And it was an exit that um, really came really close to the exit I had designed for myself. Um, but um, the reason, he says, the reason for the pancreatic cancer was really, um, it was a combination of a physical manifestation and a spiritual manifestation. Um, the spiritual manifestation came from my dad. Um, my whole life, I was surrounded by two powerful people, my mom and my dad, and they were very strong. They were um, very persistent in um, their teachings to us. They were um, people that I looked up to, that I admired very much. And um, the pressure that from a subconscious level came upon me was that I needed to perform. I needed to be um, the best for them. I needed to have their approval, their validation that what I was doing was good and I was going in the right direction. And so my whole life, I struggled with a fear of not being good enough. And so everything I did was to show my mom, my dad, look at me, my, did, did, did I do good? Are you proud of me? My whole life was about getting approval and validation of others, of being worthy, of being um, a good person. So the inability for me to let go of that need 
of um, other people's approval, the inability to find that validation within myself. Um, and on top of that, my whole, okay, he says, my dad, great man, loved me to bits, but he didn't quite understand or connect to a boy being a dancer. Although mom, that was all about dancing, um, for him, there was still something there that was like, no, I'm not sure, don't know what you're going to do with that. And so my whole life, I was trying to make him proud. Everything I do, I wanted to prove to him that, hey, see, I'm going to get somewhere with this. I'm going to do something with this. I'm going to make you proud, Dad. My whole life, it was about making him proud. And so when I lost him way too early, before my career took off, I felt like I lost the chance to show him that I could be a good son, that I could make him proud with my creativity, with my abilities. And my world turned upside down and I collapsed. Mm. And that energy turned me into a person that I no longer recognized. Um, because I've always been a fighter. I've always been somebody who had a, a huge amount of self-discipline, who um, knew that I could accomplish anything, but I had to work for it, and I had to train, and I would push myself to every limit that I came, and if I came to a stop, then I would push myself a little bit further than that. That's how, who I was. That's how I was raised. And then when dad died, I lost that. I didn't recognize myself anymore. I gave up. I started drinking heavily. And so that energy, that feeling of never having the chance again to prove to my dad that I'm worthy as his son added upon the manifestation of the cancer. Now you add the alcoholism that came with that death, I became severely um, addicted to alcohol. And you add three packs of cigarettes a day, you create pancreatic cancer. So the spiritual energetic manifestation was of the cancer um, came from not being able to overcome that not being able, and, and the plan was for me to feel it, to go deep, but to rise above it. And I never truly did. Hence the creation of, hence I couldn't stop the creation of the cancer, which was a physical expression, a combination of the alcohol and the cigarettes. Um, and so if I had overcome that fear and found a good place again to be in, rediscovered you know, my full potential Full blown, and have would have let go of that need to satisfy, that need to be loved by others, that need to be validated by others. Then that power would have been strong enough to push the cancer to way later. But I attracted it faster. It came faster on my path than it was originally planned due to the inability of being able to let go of the native energies. Does that make sense, he says? Fuel. Absolutely. Now, did you, did you come into this life? Because it sounds almost like a contract that you had with your father for, for it to play out that way. So did you come into this life? I, I don't know. What I'm, what I'm seeing is that we come in with these hardships in place that we can either go over them or we can crash right into them. So are these opportunities that we have in our lives to rise above different situations? He says all relationships that I had were extreme lessons of acceptance and surrendering and um, unconditional love. And every relationship that comes into your path <clears throat> Um, will have an effect on you and it's 
your choice on how you choose to respond to that relationship or that event that comes with that relationship. And so either way, whether it is um, a positive or a negative experience, the experience is valuable and the experience is priceless and it's going to learn and, and expand your soul. Um, so my dad was here to push me into um, finding my individuality. Mm -hmm. um, and did I achieve that? Um, not really, because I really created my Patrick character around my parents, um, around who they wanted me to be. Um, Lisa helped me to soften that. Lisa helped me to say, hey, what do you want? Mm -hmm. Who do you want to be? She helped me and softened that. So to a degree, I experienced it, but I didn't fully experience it, and that was a personal choice. Um, so what I want to explain is that when it comes to relationships, it doesn't matter whether or not you – experience exactly that that you had designed for yourself it doesn't matter what it matters is that you had an experience and however that might have worked out or however that whatever that might have manifested in your journey is going to be wonderful and it's going to be beautiful and it's going to be educational and it's going to be expensive and and that's what's important is not to judge or feel paranoid or afraid of am I going am I going to fulfill my journey am I going to do this am I going to um you know am I on the right path uh, all of that people are so terrified of of not accomplishing what they designed for themselves but you designed to be human and you designed to just be you and to make the best of it. And yeah, we make plans and it doesn't always work out that way, but that doesn't mean that your life was less valuable. That doesn't mean that you didn't expand as a soul because it's all equally valuable. So. Well, and there's no way to know what our plans are from this side. I mean, you know, when you're in the flow, but there is really no way. Um, so when you crossed, how did that go? How was, how was your, your life review? I have to say I was happy with the result <laughs> because, um, first of all, I was loved on a more intense level than I really thought I was. I was, um, more truthful to myself than I thought I was as well. Uh, meaning that I really did everything according to what I felt was right at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, although I may have seemed very confident to people, to the outside world, yeah, I was full of fear. And, and I, I was full of insecurities. And I felt like I didn't always get the offers that I should have gotten. And I always felt... Like, you know, I, I, I was kind of suppressed in some way or form by others. But I never allowed that to stop me from pushing through. I never stopped pushing myself. And I never stopped growing. And I never stopped learning. And looking back at my life's review, I started to see that I did so much that I didn't even value when I was in a human form and that I didn't even notice. So um, it was a pleasant experience for me to just kind of see um, your own journey from a different perspective. You kind of see it from a perspective of connecting the dots, seeing the matrix and everything, how everything was connected. And it just kind of that led to that led to that led to that. It was just harmonious and it, it was in perfect order. So um, it's, really, it's really neat, he says, to see yourself <clears throat> from a perspective of non-judgment mm -hmm. because I judged myself a lot um, as a human being and um, drove, drove Lisa crazy sometimes but <laughs> it 
it's you know, I, I feel like judgment of ourselves. I think we just do that and it's such a waste of energy, right? I mean, it's just such a waste of energy because we all are human and we're all doing the best we can in that moment. But that is, so can you give us an example of something that you didn't come necessarily get during life that you look back on and you say, man, I did that right. So when, um, when I was going through a hard time with losing my dad, I almost lost Lisa. And um, I really felt shitty about that. I felt bad about what I was doing to her. And I really started to judge myself. I really started to um, hammer down on me. I really started to feel worthless and um, a ba as a bad person. And I, I went down a really black deep rabbit hole and looking back at it from a spiritual perspective that rabbit hole saved my life because in that darkness I saw things about myself that I didn't like um, I started to realize that Lisa can't help me she can't save me from this uh, my family can't save me from this. And I started to understand that I was the only one powerful enough to dig myself out of this hole. And so um, when you're in that darkness from a human perspective, you feel like going into that darkness is a bad thing you feel like you failed or you were weak. I felt like I was weak and um, that I uh, was powerless in this world. And, you know, you, you just judge yourself over and over and over again and you eventually pull yourself through it. But years after, I still saw that as I was shit then. I still judged that part of me being like that and you know from that spiritual perspective when you start to connect the dots and you start to see that hey that darkness led to the biggest victory I ever experienced mm -hmm. which was self-empowerment self-love self-respect and self-worth which was part of the lesson that I needed to learn that was my biggest victory is getting myself out of that shithole <laughs> <laughs> you know, but from a human perspective, you don't see that. You still, you know, you see, see like, oh, that was weakness. I should have been stronger. I should have, you know, I should have never let myself go, go down that rabbit hole. I should have, I should have, I should have. You know, and your whole life you carry that I should have stuff. You know, you carry this kind of shame story around. Your whole life you have this shame and this blame story. But from a spiritual perspective, Everybody around me, my team, was like, oh, my God, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Because they could see the grow process that was happening right there in that darkness. And they could see how beautiful it was and how I picked myself up and I started doing this and I started doing that and I took responsibility and so on and so forth. It's a completely different perspective on what we consider to be dark and, you know, in, in a no-go from a human perspective is being praised from a spiritual perspective. Mm, that's beautiful. And that gives a lot of people hope and that what they're walking through, they will, they'll get through. It's a tunnel and you don't know where that tunnel will drop you out. Right. And so, and, and thank you for that. Um, wow. I think kind of mic drop. No, I'm kidding. Um, that's <laughs> He's just saying have faith in the process. Um, doesn't matter where you are at this moment, whether you're in the light or in the darkness, have faith that it's a process that's going to help you grow and evolve and, you know, into being a stronger you. That's all you got to do. Just have faith that it's part of a process. 
It's part of the process. Yes, it is definitely part of the process. As a parent, you don't want your children to go through hardships, but you realize that you have to go through hardships and it's how they get up. It's how they get up. Got to get back on that horse. You know, you can't, you can't just play victim. Well, and speaking of children, do um, you mind if I ask, you guys never had kids. Was that by design or was that He says, no, it wasn't by design. Um, we wanted to have children. Um, he's making me feel like Lisa had a miscarriage at one point. Um, and um, <laughs> he's just saying things got in the way, no time, weren't together, um, you know, alcohol problem, things got in the way, he says. Um, and when the illness came, yeah, that was all she wrote. I went out the door. Um, but we always wanted to have children and it's one of my biggest regrets is that we never did. So did you have children? Um, I know that a lot of times there are, uh, children that are tapped souls that are tapped to be your children. Um, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, but did you, was that a potential? It was a, it was a, a potential. It was definitely um, a possibility. Mm -hmm. I just didn't. It just wasn't the route. It just, it just, uh, life expressed itself in a different way due to free will and choices. Beautifully said. So, you, of course, we all re fell in love with you during Ghost, or <laughs> when I watched Ghost. Now, were you drawn to this? I'm going to lighten it up a bit. Were you drawn to this? to the stuff, this ghost stuff, or was it just a great role with a, with a fun actress? And he says, I was really drawn to the story and I was really drawn to the idea of being able to communicate after death with your loved one. Um, I was raised with a religion. Um, and so I did believe in God. Um, I did believe in uh, spirits, but the way that they created the story, it just seemed like something that, you know, everybody wants to believe, but nobody was really talking about at the time. And so I really was drawn to the character. I really was drawn to the whole story of communicating with the dead um, and, and, the biggest part of the story for me was the love, mm -hmm. the love that two people shared that went to the extreme that even after death, you know, I was going to protect her and I was going to make sure she's safe. And that filled my heart with a lot of joy. And, and, and he's, he's just kind of showing me his heart expanding. <laughs> it's like, you know, I want to believe, I wanted to believe that that is how it is. Um, when we cross, that we are watching over, and guess what? <laughs> it's correct. <laughs> okay, so that's the next question. Someone asked, how did, how did the portrayal of life after life compare to ghost, to, to what's actually happening, what you're experiencing? <clears throat> and where's oh. Whoopi? Let me let me tell you this. If you look at the end scene of Ghost, mm -hmm. um, where we commun where I, I communicated um, to the love of my life, and um, in a way said goodbye. That for me happened. That was the real deal for me um, when I left my body. I stuck around for a little bit, uh, made sure everybody was fine. Um, I tried to communicate, um, and they do, they do feel you. They're just not aware that it's really you. They just kind of feel this presence. And um, so it wasn't exactly like, hey, Molly, I love you. Um, <laughs> it wasn't exactly like that, but it was very similar to that. I was talking. To Lisa, I was talking to my brothers and my sisters. I was communicating to my family, letting them know that I'm okay, helping them with their energy of grieving. Um, and eventually, I did see a light. 
and I went towards it. I just walked into the light, just kind of like you see in the movie. So I think the movie kind of inspired me to have that belief system, to have that yeah. set up, um, that that is how it was going to be. I was going to walk to the gates of heaven. Um, and so I experienced that. Um, for me, that was my transition, is really walking towards the light and having um, my dad there and other family members there and, and guides and, and people who um, felt like family, but I didn't really recognize the way that they looked. Um, so um, that part was very similar. Now, I didn't have any unfinished business, so I didn't have to stick around like my character did. Um, but I do try to reach out uh, every now and then, let them know that I'm around. And, and so I do that with music because it's just the easiest way to express how I feel. I haven't moved any items or anything like that. <laughs> no, no pennies being shoved under the door. Um, uh, he says, believe it or not, that's pretty tough, actually. It's a hard thing to do to actually uh, manifest um, or to um, reach your level to a certain degree where you can actually physically push something. A lot of spirits can do it, but it's not an easy thing for us. Um, but it's true, you know, like I say in the movie, the only thing you take with you is the love. And um, you take your love with you and you end up surrounded by love. And it's just a beautiful experience Going home is, um, it's like becoming a baby again and crawling in the arms of your mom and feeling safe and feeling worry-free and, and feeling loved. That's really what crossing over is. That's what transitioning is. It's going home and being pampered and loved and, and, and um, praised for the journey that you've encountered. And, and it's just... It's a beautiful experience, he says. Mm, thank you. I can see that. Ah, oh, that's so beautiful. That was that really helped form. I think so many of us. It helped give us that idea of what crossing is and 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 how what Emma does, how that works. And and I don't know. I think it did a lot to kind of seed our society at the time. You know, so we get to grow up with that. And you were speaking to a lot of light workers, I think that you didn't even know it. Isn't that incredible though? I just, I love that idea that you're one man standing there with, on a set and you have no idea how, what you're doing and your work is doing, how it'll affect so many people. I mean, it's just a ripple effect through, I mean, not to be corny, but kind of throughout time. I mean, it, it, it it's just beautiful. So thank you for, for doing that. It is. He says, you know, and that's the beautiful thing about getting a life's review is that from the human perspective, you know that you have an impact as an actor some way or form, but you don't fully experience it into that deep soul level. And when you get your life's review, you know, just that movie Ghost um, shaped and formed um, the transition beliefs for millions of people all over the world, you know, everybody was like, yeah, that's a how I'm going home. Uh, and, and so I created, or we created as a team, uh, you know, the possibility of, you know, going home is beautiful and it's, and it's peaceful and it doesn't need to be scary. And it changed the belief systems of a lot of people who at that moment in time weren't really sure what to believe. So, um, from your spiritual perspective, you get this sensation of all these lives that you changed just by creating, you know, a beautiful movie. And, and that is very overwhelming from, from a soul level to see the ripple effect that everything has. So um, don't underestimate the effect that you have on the collective. You're just one thought is already affecting thousands of people. So become very aware of what you do and what you say and what you think and what you feel because it affects all of us. Okay, that's a big order. Sounds very simple, but it is not. Sounds simple. <laughs> well, well, okay, so, so being able to carry that awareness. Okay, so, so a different person asked if, if this was your first life as a... So, 
celebrity? Um, he's saying it was the first life that was so intense as a public person. Um, it was the most intense and the most disciplined life I experienced as, you know, as, as a celebrity, if you want to look, call it that way. Um, he says, I have another life where I'm in the public eye, where I am an actor in a theater group in ancient Rome, um, which is very different than the acting I did as Patrick, he says. Um, but that lifetime for me in ancient Rome was all about surrendering and it was about enjoying myself and making other people laugh, you know, which, which was a great experience because um, their laughter, because I was a comedian and, that, you know, we would do um, plays that made people laugh. Um, we used masks. We all had masks on. Sometimes I played the woman. Sometimes I played the man. Um, but they were always comedies. And um, this is a time frame where people are all about survival um physical survival now we're very much into the mental survival um it was all about physical survival back then um and in just trying to build up something for themselves and so um they you could feel the tension and the, and the pressure that people would put upon each other. You could feel uh, the injustice that would go on a lot. And so people really kind of um, were very appreciative when we came out and made them laugh because they forgot for a few hours who they were, what the problems were. And to this day, comedians do that. You know, they, they just, they take all your worries Put it in a drawer for a little bit and just allow yourself to to be free from that you know and in um, so for me that was a very um, it was it was a lifetime of being in the public eye but not being um, chased or uh, you know not being viewed um, your personal life not being viewed because a lot of times we were wearing masks so nobody didn't really know who we were so we were completely free uh, in our spare time and then on stage you got the satisfaction of you know the joy that you brought and the praises and all of that so it was a really comfortable fun experience for me where I just needed to surrender to all that was and just learn to go with the flow as Patrick, this was really an intense and very disciplined life because, you know, I was trying to control everything, my outcomes, where I was going. I was uh, born into a family who loved me very much, but where mom and dad were very like, ah, you got to go that way, pushing and, and discipline and, you know, things like that. So um, it was a completely different experience being an actor. Um, but it was also a more valuable lesson where um, one life lesson um, came with a million different side lessons attached to it, you know. That's what I see is that the first life, the world is so small and, and, and your needs, though, are greater to eat, to survive, to not, you know, die by a stubbed toe. Um, but it's so much quieter where this time there's so many more, the word that I just heard were V-A-R-I-A-B-L-E-S, variables, there we go. And, and there are just so many more. I mean, it's like, it's like, okay, so we'll take that life and we're going to add celebrity and we're going to add TV and we're going to add magazines. And, you know, you, you now have access to billions of people. And so it just seems like it's just so overwhelming, but that's, um, but I love the way you say that. And I, I think, where do you think that began? Where do you think that whole, the way we view people 
um, this celebrity, this, this, we own you, you know, you, you make millions of dollars, but yet we own you. Where do you think that began on the timeline? He says it started pretty early. Um, as soon as people started to um, live together, as soon as, as soon as people started to create cities and societies, you had people who wanted to be in charge. And as long as you have people who want to overpower others, you're going to have um, that kind of mentality that's just going to grow and expand and change over time. But it's always going to be present where you feel or you experience that you are being um, controlled by others in some way or form. So, so then in that vein, uh, when someone's a movie star or someone, it, it, it's interesting because that's even bigger. I mean, that's even more m m magnified. I want to turn my hair purple and change my eyes. I mean, I can run off and be someone else, but you can't because people will know who you are. So that is, that's got to be claustrophobic on one level. He says, on the way it is, but for me, it really also depends on how you choose to experience that criticism and although i wanted people to love me and and like me um i have to say that i feel like i did stay very grounded mm -hmm. in my own beliefs and in my own being and um their criticism would reach me to some degree, but not to a point where I felt like I needed to change my decision making or I needed to change what I was doing to please them. I wanted the validation, but um, the biggest validation I wanted was from my family. That was my number one. Um, but um, <clears throat> so, did your mom and dad fight? Because it seems like if your mother was a dancer, and your father thought is kind of a sissy way. I don't know if that's right, but if, if he thought that and your mom thought it was, you know, that was her life's work, it seems like that they would be at odds for what they wanted for their son. And they, you know, they're just like every other family. They have their ups and downs. They have their disagreements. They have their, um, mom thought it this way dad saw it the other way and you know it would come to a rumble um and you know when you're dealing with two very strong-minded people you'll get uh, very intensified arguments um but you know it wasn't they also respected each other i thought they also had respect uh, dad had much respect for what mom was doing he just didn't understand why his son wanted to do that <laughs> You know, girls are fine. Girls are fine. Um, you know, um, but, um, you know, that's why, you know, I tried to please dad a lot. You know, I went into football. I went into wrestling. Um, I went into fishing. You know, I, 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 was, I was excelling in so many different directions um, that I got a whole bunch of scholarship offers from all different, you know, different angles. Uh, and I still chose dance <laughs> to my dad's, uh, you know. But, um, yeah, you know, parents fight is what they do sometimes. And, and, and that's normal. We live, um, when we live together, there's different energies flowing. And sometimes that creates an explosion that we will learn from and that we will um, grow from and expand from. So, um, so yeah, they would fight. Mm -hmm. so, I, I, so this fella told me this story two weeks ago and his dad was a buddy of yours and he said something about you guys were in Huntsville and you went you were you were about to go fishing and y'all were at a store like a, a little like stopping to get gas and water beer whatever and uh and this man was mad because you weren't from there you were from out of town you were young and you're probably in high school and he cut in front of you something happened and you went outside and you waited for him and so as soon as he stepped out of the door you hammered him in the in the face 
And so, so yeah, I think it sounds like you either had a temper or I don't know. I had, uh, like I said, I had those fears of not being good enough, not being a, a worthy. Um, so I had a lot of insecurities and that expressed itself into um, attacking people sometimes, you know, he was not the only one. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, to be, I mean, I know I like you, but it, it sounds like you, it, they would provoke. And instead of stepping down, you would say, okay, dude, bring it. You know, I mean, that it was well, usually, I, you know, he says, I was raised with a cowboy. <laughs> My dad was a cowboy. And, you know, as a man, you stand up for yourself. That's just how it was. You know, I had two other brothers, two younger brothers. You, we were learned, we were taught, stand up for yourself, you know, don't let yourself get beat up, beat first. Um, that's kind of, you know, it's, it was part of the way that I was raised is to defend your values and defend um, what you believed in. You know, if somebody would hurt a woman, I'd be like stepping in and going, hey, you just don't do that. You know, I was the one holding doors open for women and you know, that's just kind of who I was. That's how I was raised. So it was about, um, I didn't like injustice and I didn't like um, really people being disrespectful. That really pushed my buttons. And so when they would do that, yeah, sometimes I, I express that in a way that I might, maybe I shouldn't have, but um, I will. <laughs> I I grew up with a lot of folks like that. So that was awesome. I mean, I, I, I view that as, you know, not putting up with bad behavior. Um, okay. So here's a question and I've debated whether or not I wanted to ask it because I feel like it sounds very disrespectful, but maybe it gives you an opportunity to clear up something that's out there. Um, let's see. Someone wanted to know, they had read somewhere um, that there are new stories that mentioned that your wife w was cruel to you. Have you, do you know anything about this? He says, yes, those were rumors that were being spread. However, uh, the answer is absolutely not. And um, I should be the one apologizing to her for the way that I treated her during my dark days of depression and alcoholism and um, I want everyone to know and understand that she loved me unconditionally and supported me every step of the way and um, she would never ever hurt me okay. if it got to a fight that seemed explosive she would either step out or just go and stay over at her mom's <laughs> Her day. Um, that's what that's what would happen. But she was never physically abusive towards me. No, I sometimes would get to that point, and then she was like, "I'm out of here. If you're going to be like that, fuck you. Come back yeah. to me when you're back to yourself." Because I became two very different people with drink and without drink. Mm. Okay, there, there. I'm glad we I'm glad we got through that one. Um, okay. I have a question for you. This one's for me. So I'd read somewhere about your plane crash and this was, I believe you may, I'm not sure exactly when it was, but there was thought that there was alcohol involved. And it turns out from what I read that, no, that was not the case, that it was carbon, not carbon monoxide. There was something in the cabin or maybe the, the pressure when you landed dropped too fast. Um, and you had the dogs with you and you had the, um, but you were like, here, take the beer. But the beer and the wine were under the plane. They, they were not in the actual cabin. <laughs> He's kind of going, um, well, there was some alcohol involved, um, but it was also, He's showing me like making a wrong movement, which shook up something in the airplane, uh, which created a, a drop of pressure mm -hmm. in the airplane. That's what he's showing me. But he's showing me it was 
the alcohol that created the wrong movement that created the okay thank you i was curious about that because at the beginning it said that then at the end it said no that they believe that that's what it was okay so let's see dear patrick you loved horses all right totally understand could you please tell about why these animals were so special to you he says several reasons uh the first reason was they were the love of my dad's life <laughs> so they made me feel connected to him um they made me feel like dad wanted me to do something with horses and um so they made me feel closer to my dad that's number one number two they're very powerful intelligent beings and i really admire the way that they surrender to us humans because they have the power to kick us bite us you know kill us if they really wanted to but they have this love and they have this connectiveness to earth and to all creatures on earth to a degree to such a degree that they will even surrender to a human being and say okay we're going to do this together we're going to create a partnership and um, as long as you treat me well i'm going to treat you well so you create this bond this love um, energy between you and this massive animal and when i would ride it gave me a feeling of freedom mm -hmm. it gave me a feeling of um being connected to source and i know that might sound weird um but it really it was like the animal was um a way for me to connect to god and um when i was riding or when i was working with them first of all i liked the fact that they were listening to me that was kind of fun um you know because i had control over something but the biggest part was that you had this connection that was without words didn't need words it didn't need um approval it, there was no judgment it was just one pure energetic connection of love and um that's why as humans we're so connected to animals we get so drawn to them because they're pure they're in their purest form and when we connect to them we connect to source we connect to all that is we connect to the universe and we feel that connection it's almost like we recognize ourselves in them we recognize who we could be we recognize who we are in our purest form and that's why we feel so comfortable with them. So I hope that makes sense, he says. No, it absolutely does. I mean, they're so t telepathic and they're just unconditional. They don't, there's no agenda. Maybe the agenda is take me for a walk. <laughs> that's about it. Mm -hmm. they just love it. <laughs> I understand, I love it, that's beautiful. Um, okay. Oh, this is a good one. All right, this is, Sirius Jones, love to both yourself, Patrick and Emma. My question, is there anything you wish someone from the other side had told you as a human while you were, quote, treading life water? Right smack bang in the, I think you've answered this sort of, um, of the darkest part of being a human. He says, I wish somebody would have come down and said, you know what? It's only temporarily. You're going to be fine. Just have fun with it. <laughs> so damn seriously. <laughs> serious. We take life too serious and, and we really make it a lot harder on ourselves than it really should be. Oh my God. Don't we though? Don't we? We really do. Uh, it, it, it's impressive how serious we take ourselves. So now who do you hang out with on that side? 
well, I wouldn't call it hangout, but you know, some characters I do or some, some entities I do um, connect with um, energetically, uh, which is John Wayne. Um, who's that? <laughs> Getting a picture. Dean Martin? Mm -hmm. Really? He said Dean Martin has this flair of not giving a shit. And I wish I had that <laughs> as a human being. You know, so um, he really didn't care and he just kind of lived life the way that he saw fit. And, and that energy is something that I've always been attracted to. Um, it's a freedom. It's a freedom that he has that, um, that I love. So when I'm around him, I feel completely free. Now, from a spiritual perspective, I'm always free. But from the Patrick perspective, I love learning from him. He has lots of wisdom inside of him, he says. And he had some great experiences. A lot of his lifetimes are very, very different than Dean Martin, but very uh, powerful. So you should put him on the show one day, he says. Um, and then my dad, of course, I hang out with my dad. I hang out with my mom. Um, but it's not, you know, it's, it's people want to believe that we're just kind of having everybody over for tea and coffee. Um, it, it's no longer in that shape or form, but we get drawn to people, to energies that really resonate with us or that we want to learn from or that we want to, you know, uh, share experiences with. So uh, it's more from that perspective, he says. So on, on this plane, of course, we have time and, you know, it's very, I'm, I can't, I can't say else. Anyway, um, and I know you don't on your side of the veil. So just play, just humor me. How much, how, how much time do you spend here? How much do you time do you spend hanging out or hanging out on the earth plane, either in the woods or with the horses or with Lisa or friends? He says, that's a really hard question to answer because we're everywhere wherever we want to be all at the same time. Oh, but do you want me to just humor you and go, yeah. okay, I am there <laughs> in the morning when Lisa wakes up and I'm there in the evening when she goes to bed. Okay. How's that sound? <laughs> and when they're having a party, when they're having a party, I will be there all day. <laughs> That's fun. That's fun. So, I have to say, I think it took balls for you to do She's Like the Wind, for you to create that and to sing that. And that was, I, I remember thinking, this is not him. This is not him singing. That was a great song. You did a beautiful job. So that took guts, I think. He says, I loved writing songs and I loved uh, recording songs. And I've made more songs than just that one. So I'm hoping that... Um, my dream was to bring out a whole album. And I was working on that for years and years and years and years, but it never really happened. So oh, I'm never hoping that even after my transitioning, that eventually that album will be released. Oh, that would be cool. Okay, so we're putting all that out there, everybody. So putting it out there. there. Okay, so... Jenny wants to know, Mr. Swayze, what is something about you no, uh, no one knew about you? Thank you for the great films you did. He's saying, oh, wow, that is a tough, tough question because when you're a celebrity, um, they dig into your life to the smallest little detail. So let me think about that, he says. He says, well, <clears throat> I'll give you an overall view. I loved sushi, loved sushi, um, loved flying airplanes, riding songs, and I loved my Arabian horses. My favorite perfume was Boucheron. I love Boucheron. Mm -hmm. And he says, Lisa's favorite perfume is Trezor. 
<laughs> he says, my favorite color is blue. My favorite horse is Tamman. My nickname was Little Buddy. I love playing the piano, but I also played the guitar. I tried playing the violin, but I sucked at it. <laughs> what else? <laughs> that is so cool. I hope that's good enough. <laughs> okay, so so did you ever hang out with, uh, I know you guys did the movie together a long time ago, Billy Bob Thornton? Because I know he, I think he's from Houston. And Clint Black and and um, the Quaid brothers. I don't know if you knew any of them. I mean, that's like saying, "Hey, you live in Houston. I don't know Do you know that name? Do it. I don't know the Quaid brothers personally. <laughs> As for but, me, um, Dennis Quaid and Randy Quaid. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I didn't know those were brothers. Never thought about that. <laughs> I learned so much today. Woohoo! See. Well, he's making me feel like um. Houston's a big city. He did get along with a lot of people. Um, he had the utmost respect for a lot of the people that he worked with. Um, he's saying, if I would have to choose, because, see, a lot of people ask me also, what kind of, you know, which movie did I like the most and all of that. And it's really hard to pick one because they're all your babies. And I made sure that I picked roles where they wouldn't put me um, in the corner, you know. No, Maybe in the corner. Nobody puts Patrick in the corner, he goes. <laughs> so bad. That is so bad. I didn't want to be stereotyped, you know, because so many mm -hmm. other people are and. Uh, and so that's why I chose such a wide variety of roles because I wanted to try everything and I wanted to show people that, you know, I could do a lot of different things. But I think when it comes to um, the movies, it's equally important in enjoying um, the people you work with. And that's how friendships kind of get started and that's how sometimes you hang out. But a lot of times our schedules are so busy that it's really hard to find time to say, okay, now we can come together. Or we can do something together. So, um, but the people that I really enjoyed working with was first of all, Whoopi Goldberg. Mm, yeah. She's Loved amazing. Her. Um, I didn't want to do the movie without her. I'm the one they didn't, they were, didn't, they were not give, going to give her the role, the part. She got the part because I said, no, either she, she does it or I'm not doing it either. <laughs> So I love her, love her. I loved working with Sam Elliott. Mm. And I loved Liam Neeson in Next of Kin. So those are people that I really, truly enjoyed. And I learned so much from that they became really good friends for me. And um, he says, just to go back to the other question, so who was the, the, the co-star that I enjoyed working with the most, you know, was first of all, Lisa, because we did movies together. Um, but um, I would also say Mikey. You say Mikey was my horse in Tall Tale. Oh. <laughs> that was my, my coolest co-star ever. Two-legged, <laughs> not four-legged. That's funny. That's funny. He's just laughing. <laughs> He's just giggling. Oh, okay. So let's see. Is there anything else that you would like to share or you would like to pass on today? He says, I just want people to know that, um, I want to talk a little bit about relationships. Um, cause a lot of people saw me and Lisa as this, perfect couple and um people see what they want to see that's number one okay and um the relationship was far from pro perfect but when you find someone where you instantly feel this massive connection and you feel like this is your best friend and you can 
talk about anything, you know, hold on to those relationships because, you know, there, there's a purpose behind why you're feeling that close to that person. And um, in any relationship, he says, that you encounter, in order for a relationship to last, you always have to keep in mind that relationships aren't perfect. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. And that as long as you take responsibility for how the relationship is progressing, because there's always two parts to it. Um, if you start blaming the other party, for everything that's going wrong if you don't take responsibility or at least part of the responsibility for things that feel uncomfortable for things that don't seem to work out the way that you wanted them to um, the relationship will fail so you need to understand that in any relationship there's responsibility necessary from both parties there is a degree of acceptance and non-judgment communication necessary and you need to find an unconditional love within your heart, no matter how the other person chooses to act or express itself, himself to you. Um, what I mean is, in a relationship, you need to find acceptance that every single person is here on their own unique journey and they have chosen you to share that life with them and that no matter what happens in the relationship as long as you take responsibility for your own actions in that relationship and as long as you can find acceptance and love for the other person uh, str for the other person's struggles or ideas or thoughts and as long as you love yourself enough to be true to your own needs and wants, then uh, the relationship will always provide you with what you need in order to grow and achieve that. Now, um, when it comes to marriages, uh, people give up very fast nowadays. They change marriages like they change their underwear. And he says, we had massive ups and downs. We were very strong individuals. Um, we both had <laughs> a great degree of stubbornness. We both had a great deg degree of drive and persistence and discipline. And so we loved big and we fought big. Um, but we understood that a relationship takes work. It takes communication. And it takes uh, the ability to listen to one another without having judgment in your heart. And only then will you be able to overcome the hurdles and the discussions and the misunderstandings and the arguments is by communicating in a respectful, loving way towards one another and being completely honest about what you feel and what you're experiencing at that moment. It's the only way, he says, for a romantic relationship to be able to survive a very hectic world right now. It's beautiful. That's a lot. Um, but it sounds like giving up was never an option. I think you can fight big as long as you know, you're both will show up at the dinner table, you know, it's about understanding that, um, when you love someone, you have to love all of them, not just bits and pieces. Right. And the other ones, we're going to try to change or we're going to sweep it under the carpet and then it'll be good. No, I, 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 I and then it explodes in your face. <laughs> it turns into cancer. Yeah. That's exactly right. Well, thank you. It's so funny. You, I, I keep hearing words that I'm, I know you use and it just, it's just cracking me up. This has just been such a fun interview. I know. I'm just all calm now because he's so gentle. His energy is like, oh, it just feels I, <laughs> I agree. 
once you once you bring it down okay so everybody we started this before and i just phew, went somewhere else so we had to do it again because i was a little bit i'm doing it again i'm starting to blush anyway <laughs> that's okay well, he just has that effect on people i'm pretty sure he's pretty intense all right guys thank you so much for hanging out with us yes thank you for watching messages from beyond um and i think that's it for me any last think, any last words nope i think i may go dance i'm gonna go get a dirty on. dancing do you know my husband loves dirty dancing too i just wanted to he loves to do it or to watch it not they're not just chick flicks people i have it on not okay i'm about to really show my age i have it on vhs <laughs> You still have a, a, a player for that? I do. Oh my do. god! You should see it. It's like the little things go up, and you're like, okay, all right, we're kids. Don't put baby in the corner. You know, you can do it. <laughs> anyway, thank you, everybody. We love Listen. you. Yeah. See you later. Bye. Bye.